So in the tech world, one of the buzz terms du jour is deep learning, um, a form of AI that, that loosely speaking, uh, can learn tasks by analyzing vast amounts of data. And just over the past few years, it has, um, I think it's safe to say, reinvented so many of the, the internet services that we now use. It's, it's the basic technology that recognizes photos um, in your Facebook feed or understands commands you speak into your Android phone. And um, uh, despite its sort of sudden appearance on the tech scene, it's a very old technology. And, and Jan, um, who is uh, now the head of AI research at Facebook, is one of the founding fathers of, of this technology. It dates back um, 30 years, um, started in academia. Um, you know, why is it that this, this old idea, Jan, is now suddenly coming to the fore? Probably a combination of three things. The first one is uh, the uh, availability of powerful computers that really were limiting what we could do with those techniques in the past. The availability of, of large data sets. Turns out those techniques really shine when you train them with tons of data. And the third thing is you know, a bunch of new ideas that we've come up with in the last 30 years. So the, the basic principles were there back then, and there was some success uh, back in the old days, like you know, check reading systems and things like that, that were widely developed, but widely de deployed. But, um, um, but they were limited in the, in the kind of size of the images they could process and the complexity of the functions they could, uh, they could take. And then there is a, a fourth factor, which is just psychological. It's kind of the sociology of the scientific uh, community sort of you know, coming to terms with the fact that those techniques actually work. So what kind of, of data are we talking about? I mean, uh, can you say, give people an idea specifically of what kind of data you need for a particular task. Right, so a lot of the applications that we use deep learning for use a form of learning called supervised learning. So a typical application is you want, to, you want a machine to recognize images. You collect a few million images of a few different, you know, a few thousand uh, different categories, you know, table, chairs, dogs, people, things like that, you know, all the way down to like, you know, obscure breeds of dogs and species of plants and stuff like that. And you show those examples repeatedly to the machine, show it a table, and then the machine says, it's not a table, you, you tell it, yeah, actually, that's a table, and it corrects itself, so next time you show the same image or something similar, it would say it's a table. And so, right now, this mode of learning requires quite a lot of examples. You, um, on the order of a few million for, uh, for images, uh, you, we also use those uh, systems to do um, uh, speech recognition, uh, text translation, machine translation, language translation, uh, and also text understanding, so figuring out what particular topic a piece of text uh, talks about, or, um, or even um, uh, summarize a piece of text, or, or, or do things of this type. You know. One key there, I think, is that, uh, that people, not a lot of people understand is that this, these large data sets are labeled, so to speak. So yeah. in essence, you have to have humans who will label the data, and sometimes that could be you know, people actively, uh, like Facebook saying, all right, we're gonna have some people actively label this data. Sometimes it's labeled by the world at large, right? People across the net have, have right. just naturally labeled data for you. Right, so, uh, and that's really the limitation of supervised learning, this mode of learning that deep learning really uses mostly. Um, uh, it requires reliable labels, if you want. So, uh, you know, we can have people look at pictures and label them, you know, figure out what category of the, the object is, is in the picture. Um, but we can also do things where the label come from, from, the labels come from the community. For example, you want to predict hashtags from a piece of text or from, uh, from an image. Uh, that's just data that's available if you run a social network. Right. Um, um, and then the next step is uh, uh, use just the data in the world to get the machine to understand how the world works. And that's called predictive learning. And there's a lot of research on this, but uh, we haven't really solved that problem yet. It's kind of an open question, really. Let's get a bit more concrete. So you joined Facebook in late 2013. Um, how specifically, like with specific applications that everyone here can use and does use, how, are, how is this manifesting itself on, on Facebook? So to some extent, you could say that Facebook is entirely built around machine learning, and there is a, more and more of those functionalities that now use deep learning everywhere. So. Uh, perhaps one of the most immediate one that you see is uh, face recognition. So you upload a picture on Facebook and uh, your, your friends in those pictures are automatically labeled. Uh, 
uh, that's face recognition that uses deep learning. It uses, in fact, a technique called convolutional networks, which is something I invented about 30 years ago when I worked at Bell Labs across the river, um, um, you know, an hour south from here in Holmdale, New Jersey. So those techniques uh, have been sort of scaled up you know, over the last few years and really work very, very well for things like face recognition. It's also used for image recognition. So uh, Facebook users upload on the order of one billion photos on Facebook every day. This is just counting Facebook, so it's not counting WhatsApp, Instagram, uh, Messenger, etc. just Facebook. And those images are being recognized by a deep learning system, also a convolutional net, um, that uh, identifies uh, all the objects in the image, and that's used to pick what piece of content to show you that are most likely to interest you. So uh, every day you, when you connect to Facebook, Facebook can show you two or 3,000 items, uh, something like um, you know, news items, posts from your friends, pictures, videos, etc. And nobody has time to look at two or 3,000 items every day. So the, uh, the, the automatic machine learning systems at Facebook select about 100 or 150 to show you the things that you really you want to see, things you would be interested in that you know, are determined to be the thing you would most likely be interested in uh, from people you are, you are strongly connected with. And that requires two things. It requires understanding content, so understanding what a post talks about, what an image contains, what a video uh, contains, and also understanding your interests. And so that uh, increasingly relies on deep learning. Certainly image recognition entirely relies on deep learning, but even the other processes that are involved in this rely increasingly on deep learning nowadays. And with, with image recognition and speech recognition in particular, part of it is that these, these uh, deep learning technologies um, have become so proficient at, at those particular tasks that they've kind of outstripped the technology we had before, right? And um, that's part of it. But the other part is that um, uh, the scale's better, right? It's, it's, we can accelerate the progress of this type of thing um, much quicker. The older method was more let's hand code how this is going to work, right? Now it can learn from the data. Yeah, so that, that goes at the, at the heart of really what deep learning is. Uh, the, the standard way of building pattern recognition systems, whether they are applied to images or text or video, is that uh, you, you, you have scientists and engineers design uh, what we call a feature extractor, which is um, something that uh, essentially turns the raw signal into something that the, the machine can kind of digest if you want. Um, so it identifies sort of basic uh, patterns and motifs in an image. Uh, for example, if you want a system that detects cars, it will have some, you know, wheel detector and things like that. And then, and then you will use a relatively simple machine learning technique on top of it to actually do the classification. So that's a classical way of doing uh, image recognition up until, you know, let's say 2012. And then, uh, you know, uh, techniques such as uh, convolutional nets and deep learning are techniques where the, the machine you can, can be seen as sort of a, successions, a succession, a cascade of modules each of which takes, um, so the first one takes the, the raw input from the, from the image, the pixel values from the image, if you want, and turn, turns it into a representation where very simple motifs are detected on the image, and then the next one over, assemble those motifs into kind of more complex patterns, the ne next one detects parts of objects, and the next one assembles those parts of objects into objects. So you have this kind of hierarchical um, uh, architecture, multi-layer architecture, which is why we call it deep. But the crucial point is that all of those modules are trainable. So we don't need to handcraft a feature extractor by hand anymore. Uh, we can just build this architecture, train it with lots of data, and all of the layers will adapt in such a way that it, it can do vision from end to end. And the beauty of it is that you can essentially use the same technique and fit it with video, text, um, you know, medical imaging, uh, you know, pictures from a, a camera in a car, or whatever for self-driving cars. And so those techniques have become a big hammer and now everything looks like a nail and we can kind of hammer at yeah. every problem we encounter. Your, your colleague David Marcus was on this stage this morning talking about Facebook Messenger and uh, another big buzz term in the tech world, uh, chatbots. Um, and so n now that deep learning has had such success with, with speech recognition, image recognition, the next big frontier seems to be what's called natural language understanding, the ability for machines to, to understand the natural way we humans talk and then respond to it. And if we're ever going to reach um, you know, that, that kind of chat bot which can really um, interact with us in a, in, a, in, a, in a natural way and use natural language, deep learning is going to be a big part of that. It's, it's going to be a big part of that, yes. 
Yeah, I realize, I, I to apologize, I'm, I'm the second Facebook guy here this morning with a mild French accent. Um, uh, yeah, so, I mean, certainly uh, dialogue systems, virtual assistants, uh, and everything that has to do with natural language understanding is sort of a, a big area of research at the right. moment using deep learning. So deep learning, you know, several years ago, about six years ago, revolutionized speech recognition. The reason why now you can speak to your, your phone and it will mostly understand what you say uh, is deep learning. Uh, the error rates in speech recognition have been divided by a factor of three or so uh, in the last six years because of deep learning. And that happened around 2010, 2011. Around 2013, the same thing happened for computer vision. So all of computer vision from one day to the next switched to using deep learning because some big competition was won by one of those big convolutional nets. Um, and, um, and that really completely changed the, the, opened the door to all kinds of applications. And that's what has caused a, a flurry of, uh, of new applications of computer vision, self-driving cars and things of that type. Um, now the next frontier, if you want, for deep learning is natural language understanding. Uh, so the, the progress there has been more, more kind of continuous, if you want. There were indications back in the 2008 by, uh, in the early 2000s, first by Joshua Benjo, who is a professor at the University of Montreal, and then around 2008 by uh, Jason Weston and Ronald Colbert, who are now at, at Facebook. At the time, they were working at the NEC Research Institute in Princeton. And they, 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 they came up with a system to understand text or to analyze text or parse a piece of text that was based on, on deep learning that really kind of changed a little bit the way people thought about this. There was a lot of resistance at first, um, but now it's kind of basically taken over. And so there's a lot of work in the research community on uh, deep learning for, for, for text. And in the last two or three years, those systems have started beating records. So as of today, the best experimental systems for translation, the, the, the ones that do a bit, the, the best job at translating text from one language to another, are deep learning systems. They're not yet deployed commercially. They, we're just on the cusp of that. A number of companies, I think, are just about to kind of deploy uh, sort of neural net based, deep learning based uh, translation systems. But, uh, but in the lab, those are the best techniques nowadays and the, the progress is, is, very, is very quick. So the next challenge will be, how do we use those techniques for, uh, to build in, you know, intelligent agents, virtual assistants, uh, like M um, mm -hmm. at Facebook and others that, uh, really understand what, what people say, what people mean. Right. And what we're missing there, we, we, we can build useful systems already, but we have to build a lot of them by hand. We kind of have to hand script a little bit, a lot of what, uh, what those systems can, uh, can do, the kind of, you know, the tree of possibilities that people can say and kind of figure out what to, what to respond. What we'd like is a machine that can learn this from experience, just learn to help people, essentially. Right. Um, and we're missing a big piece for this that we call predictive learning that we are working very actively on. You called it a challenge, and it, it is a challenge. Uh, uh, you know, part of it is that um, the data is harder to come by, right? Uh, with images, there are so many images across the net. They've been labeled. Um, when it comes to getting um, the right data that can help teach machines to, to understand natural language, um, it's, it's not necessarily there. It's not necessarily labeled. Um, uh, how do you get over that, those, those humps? So first of all, um, babies learn language and learn you know, how to associate uh, language with objects and world situations extremely quickly with a, a relatively small amount of data, you know, in just a couple of years of life, essentially, three years of life, let's say, uh, which when you think about it is not a huge amount of example. It's a lot less than what we can feed to a machine in a few days. So, um, so there is something in uh, human and animal learning that we haven't captured because we don't have learning algorithms that can learn in these conditions. Uh, you know, just by observing the world, figuring out how the world works, and then associating symbols to it and kind of understanding interaction like this. So, uh, so we're missing a big fundamental piece here, which a lot of us are doing research on, but it's, it's an unsolved problem. I think once we figure this out, uh, again, we call this predictive learning or unsupervised learning, uh, AI is gonna make another big, uh, big jump, I think. Uh, but it's gonna, we don't know how long it's gonna take because we haven't really uh, figured out the, the basic principles. Right. So I don't think it's lack of data in the sense that we do have lots of data of people dialoguing with each other. It's just right. that to train a machine to hold a dialogue, uh, you have to actually have it hold a dialogue with a real person. And when the machine is not good at it, the, that person is not gonna be happy uh, about what's right. going on. So what we'd like is be able to train machines by imitation. So they, they would watch over the shoulder 
of real people interacting, you know, acting as virtual assistant, and, right. and then learn from that. And that's part of what we, uh, of the experiment that we're doing with M, of sort of trying to figure out really what people would do with, if they had a, you know, intelligent, sort of human level intelligence virtual assistant, and then also use that as, as kind of data to bootstrap a machine learning system to emulate humans. So ultimately, you want uh, machines that can learn um, from unlabeled data, right? Um, data that you don't have humans carefully label. Um, so is there, is there a, a path to that? Do we know what that path is now? So there's a number of different ideas on uh, predictive learning. So predictive learning is, is the following. If I, um, if I uh, uh, let me uh, show you a, a very simple example here, uh, perhaps a demonstration, and unfortunately I don't, uh, I'm not sure I have what I need here. Okay, here is a phone, right? If I put the phone on the table and I hold it with my finger and I, I am gonna tell you I lift my finger, what's gonna happen? You know the phone is gonna fall one way or the other. You probably can't tell which side. Uh, because that would require really having an accurate estimate of, of, of the angle and how I lift my finger, right? So you can predict sort of conceptually what's gonna happen. It may fall on the left or fall on the right, but you can't really predict exactly what's gonna happen. So we'd like machines to be able to predict what's gonna happen in the world, either as a consequence of their own actions or just because the world is the world. Uh, so how do we get machines to predict what's gonna happen? We can have them watch videos and then stop the video and ask them, predict what, what the next frame is gonna look like. And we can do a decent job at this, not perfect, but kinda decent. But then if we ask them, what's gonna happen a second from now? They don't have any notion that the world is three-dimensional or the fact that objects can move independently of others unless we build that by hand into them. And so we'd like them to learn that spontaneously the way we learn it. Uh, we learn spontaneously, for example, is uh, that if an object is hidden behind another one, it's still there. If I, uh, if I now, uh, you know, if I were a magician and I, somehow could make this disappear, you'd be somewhat surprised. The idea that um, objects are kind of permanent in a way is something we learned when we were babies. Um, so all of this, everything we learn as babies uh, in the first few months or first few years of life, the enormous amount of knowledge about how the world works that we accumulate, uh, we can call that common sense. Uh, so this is what would uh, allow you to interpret a sentence, like if I say, uh, the trophy didn't fit in the suitcase because it was too big. You know that the it refers to the trophy. If I say the trophy didn't fit in the suitcase because it was too small, you know that the it refers to the, to the suitcase. And how do you know this? You know this because you picture, uh, you know what, you know, that a trophy is supposed to fit in the suitcase, the suitcase is supposed to contain things, you know, it's, it's, it's hollow and all that stuff, right? There's a lot of knowledge about this that allows you to interpret the sentence properly. And, and resolve the, the reference of the pronoun. Uh, this is, by, by, the way, by the way, a standard problem in AI is called the Winograd schema. There is you know, 150 of those uh, sentences that are ambiguous unless you know something very complex about the world. Um, if I say, uh, uh, you know, uh, Kate picks up his phone and leaves, leaves the room, which I hope you won't do, um, uh, you, you can sort of imagine a, lot, a sequence of events that has to happen. It has to probably stand up. It's gonna walk, not fly. Uh, he's gonna have to extend his arm to pick up the phone. The phone is probably a mobile phone. And there's a lot of things you can, you can deduce from just those few words because you know how the world works, you know the constraints of the world. And so we'd like machines to be able to learn this by just observing the, the spectacle of the world, if you want. Okay. And that's predictive learning. We don't really know how to do it. We have lots of ideas. One of, a very promising one is one called adversarial uh, training. It's a little complicated to explain, but uh, it's but basically you, have, you have two neural nets um, that are working together, that you call them adversarial, right? So right. one is doing one thing and one is doing another, they can kind of learn from each other. That's right, so you have one, for example, that would watch a few frames from a video and then make an attempt at predicting what the next frame is. And then you have another one, and the, what the other one is trained to do is to uh, tell us whether the frame that's being fed to it, it, it also looks at the previous frames, and it looks at the frame that's being fed to it by the predictor, and his job is to, to tell us whether it's a, it's a decent prediction or not. So for example, with this example of this uh, uh, cell phone, if, um, if the predictor predicts it falls this way, uh, but the real world, the real video says, okay, no, actually it fell, it fell that way, this uh, second neural net we call the discriminator would tell the system, okay, you know, you predicted the wrong side, but it's still okay. And so basically it's trying to learn 
what constitutes a plausible future, a plausible prediction, even if the actual thing that's observed is not, ex is not exactly, uh, uh, you know, the thing that's predicted by the, by the, by the predictor. Well, so, so those two things kind of are trained uh, against each other uh, in a sense that the predictor tries to fool the discriminator into, by producing images that the discriminator thinks are real. And since this guy is really good at determining whether, whether a prediction is real or not, then this guy gets really good at predicting things that look real. Well, I could talk about this all day. We've, we're out of time, but really quickly, I mean, it, do you think that we can get to common sense, you know, via this, this general path? Uh, it will happen. There is, you know, it's a question of time. It's a question of what technique will be crucial for this. Are we missing an essential conceptual piece or are we missing a, an essential piece of mathematics? I mean, this is why AI is not just technology development. It's really, you know, fundamental scientific research. There's a lot of completely unknown uh, uh, things to explore. And so that's why you see companies like Facebook and, and you know, Google, Microsoft, OpenAI, others, uh, you know, having real sort of forward-looking research labs is because there is all of those open questions that we really haven't solved uh, that are gonna take us to the next level. And everybody understands that, you know, there is kind of a strategic advantage in, in discovering those things. But what's important about it is that um, it's, a, it's a community effort. We, that basically means trying to understand intelligence at a fundamental level. And it's probably one of the most challenging scientific questions of our time, you know, what's intelligence along with, you know, what's the universe made of and what's life is all about. So uh, it's not something that any single company, as big as it is, can solve by itself. It's something that the entire scientific and research community as a whole and technology community can, can uh, uh, need to cooperate to solve. And that's why we practice open research. Uh, all the research we do at Facebook AI Research is published. We distribute a lot of us, uh, code in open source. We collaborate with other companies on software platforms, um, you know, deep learning software platforms in particular. And, and we, um, we, we really need to have you know, a continuous exchange uh, with, uh, with the rest of the research community in academia, public research, and uh, you know, internationally. Um, uh, uh, you know, secret. Doing research in secret just doesn't work. So true. Thanks for coming. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Thanks, John.